going to do the Pirkei was based on the week. Last week we spoke about the order of transmission, the basis for the authenticity of our Torah, of our religion. We pointed out that in terms of the setting parameters and a direction which guarantees the authenticity and the exactness of the transmission that it's as it was given at Sinai, it's identically in the same context as we have it today. For instance, the five Chumashim, the five, what we call five books of Moses, every letter, every word of that book, of those five books, are the word, words of God, of Hashem. I mean, when Moshe heard, and Moshe was the scribe, and God said to him, Bereshish <clears throat> Bor Elohim, in the beginning, Elohim created. And every letter and every word that follows, every word was the word of God. Moshe was only the scribe. And Moshe was only giving over God's words. So when we study the Torah, and we say, Bereshish Bor Elohim, it's not, we're not doing something that's been paraphrased. It's not a concept which was heard and it's being transmitted. These words are the identical words themselves. The words themselves. Now, we speak about the oral law. The oral law, as we discussed, the oral law was redacted by Rabbi Yudha Nossi, Judah the Prince, and he put it into written form, which initially was a Torah violation. You were not permitted to record the oral interpretation of the Torah. It's based on verses. Initially, it had to be transmitted orally, and it was all based on being committed to memory. It cannot be written. Rabbi Yudam Nasi Judah Prince, because of the persecutions of the Romans, where they banned many times the study of Torah, and there were many other, literally, levels of cruelty and barbarism for the Jews who, if they were involved in the religion to any degree, so he felt he had to record it because to be able to retain something, memory-wise, you cannot have any level of distraction. If you have other things going on in your life, very often you have many blind spots. And even if you have a, a small blind spot, you, the accuracy is in question. Therefore, he had to record and redact the oral law, and every aspect of the oral law was included in that body of recording, which we call the Mishnah. That's the Mishnah. There's a story of Moshe Feinstein, Zechatzach Levrocha, which I've mentioned many times, who was the leading Torah, uh, halachic decisor when he was alive. So many years ago, if you lived on Lower East Side, you couldn't have a private sukkah. So we had communal sukkahs, meaning in the, the buildings usually enclosed a park area and they would build a sukkah for 150 people. And everybody would participate, pay whatever the cost was to put it up. And people were given their designated seats or tables, depending on how, much, how many people were in the family. And they would eat in the sukkah jointly Everybody would bring their own food. So Ramosha Feinstein, who lived on FDR Drive, initially when he was not very old, when he got older, he went away and he spent sukkahs in Queens with one of his students who had sukkah in his backyard. And he was, there he had privacy. He did, what, didn't participate in the communal sukkah any longer. But a number of years before that, he would participate. And of course, he would speak. And when he spoke, as I mentioned to you, he had the Talmud on his fingertips. Everything was instant recall. He was a level unto himself. And he went, and as he was speaking, he quoted a source, which was a Gemara. And one of the people who were there was also a person who had studied. And he corrects Ramosha Feinstein, and he says to Ramosha Feinstein, the page number that he's quoting is not the right number. It's a different page number. It's not questioning the 
information that he's quoting being accurate, but the page number is not correct. Okay? Ramosha Feinstein, being a very humble man, didn't say a word. They continue the meal afterwards, and they notice that Ramosha Feinstein is not there. He lived, it was about a five-minute walk from the communal sukkah to his home. He lived on the second floor in the building, and he returns. And then he bangs on the table. He says, I just want to make mention something here. I went to check to see if what I quoted was accurate or not. What I quoted was accurate. He says, why did I go check? Why? Because I am a decisor and my responsibility. And when I rule, I do not rule. I don't look up the sources. Everything's committed to memory. And if in fact, this person was right that I mistakenly quoted the wrong page, that means my memory is not accurate. Just as it may not be accurate on the page number, it may not be accurate in other information either. As a result of that, I'm no longer qualified to be a decisor. Because the way I rule, it's based on a lifetime trove of information, coalescing it and distilling it. Therefore, I'm not qualified. Therefore, it has to be at that level of accuracy. And if there's any question, because just as this is inaccurate, you never know what else is inaccurate. Therefore, he says, that's the reason why I went to check it to make sure that when I quoted, my, my quote was exactly accurate. As we know, years ago, you know, they used to say, you know, you play the, the game of telephone. You share a piece of information with one person. That person ch passes it on to the next. By the time you come to the 10th person, it's a different story. Because everybody... Do people listen well enough that they giving it over exactly as they heard? They don't. Therefore, if each person adds just something slightly based on the way he processed it, it's a different reality. So how do you guarantee the accuracy and the authenticity, which it's only authentic if it's the original, it's accurate. Therefore, there were certain people who are given that responsibility to be the transmitters of the original, authentic word of God. And that's Moshe Kibbal Torah B'Sinah and Mesorah Yoshua. Moshe was the original re recipient. Yoshua was the next qualified person. Yoshua gave it over to the elders, the elders to the prophet. And each one, based on being qualified to be the recipient, had the qualification to determine who the next person would be to have the capacity and what it took to be able to be responsible that the accuracy and the authenticity should be maintained to pass it on continuously. The Shas, the Talmud we use is called Talmud, is called the Vilna Shas. Why is it called the Vilna Shas? There was a Shas, which is a set of Talmud. It was printed in Vilna. There was a Shas that was printed in Munich, Germany which was I'm going back a few hundred years ago, which was not reliable because when they set the type and they originally had actually printed it, maybe when it said it should be permitted, it said it was forbidden. You know how many times it says in the Talmud, permitted, forbidden, pure, impure, whatever it is. You have a few printings, it becomes a whole different uh, Talmud. Therefore, there were so many inaccuracies in it. They, they said they banned it. They said nobody's permitted to study from that shas, from that edition. The Vilna shas by the greatest Torah sages of the generations was reviewed and, ref and went through. Of course, the, the many people though, like the Vilna Gon, everything was committed to memory. And he knew exactly, exactly what was and what was not. And therefore, it, they went through with a fine tooth comb that it should be accurate that the Talmud we have today is exactly the Talmud Bavli, which Ravino Ravashi, they were the last of the Amoroim, the interpreters of the Mishnah, and they compiled the Talmud, which we call Talmud Bavli. Because again, it was the famous story, event, it was a tragic event, which took place in Paris at the time of the Rambam. The Rambam in his magnum opus known as Yad Chazoka. The Yad Chazoka means the powerful hand. It's divided into 14 sections. 
And the Rambam writes in his introduction to the Yad Chazoko, and the Rambam was a codifier. He was a codifier. The Rambam's Rebbe, his name was the Rimi Gash. The Rebbe of the Rimi Gash was Rabbi Yitzchak Alfasi, known as the Rif. So these were the transmitters of the Torah, of the codified Torah from the Gaonic period. The Gaonim, it was Gaonim, that was the period which preceded the Rishonim, the early commentaries, commentators. And then there's the, the Rishonim. The Rambam in that group of people, he was known as the decisor. He was the codifier. And I'll give you an example. There's a commentary on Shas. It was written by someone named of Meiri. His name was Meiri. And the Meiri has certain appellations, references when he refers to Rashi. Rashi is known as, he refers to him as Gudoli HaMeforshim. He's the greatest commentator. Rashi is a commentator. You know, now that we studied, you know, in the Dafyomi Shkolim, besides being a different vernacular, because it was written, it's Yushalmi, it's Jerusalem Talmud, not the Bavli, there's no Rashi. There's no commentary on Rashi on that, on, on, on that, on that, on the Yushalmi. Bavli, on the Babylon, we have Rashi's commentary. We don't realize to what degree how we rely on Rashi to just understand the simple understanding of how, of the flow of the Talmud. And he writes, and it's very interesting with Rashi, if you study Rashi, today, one time, you know, you have to be a semi, semi-educated or learned to study Rashi. Today with the translation, with the vowels. Rashi, a five-year-old child could study Rashi. And you could have the leading Torah sage of the generation studying that same Rashi. And it, because Rashi wrote in a way that whatever level you are, were at, you were able to extract an understanding which was based on that person's degree of background of Torah scholarship. The Rishonim, the early, his peers in his time, they studied him because it was such a profound commentary. But how could they have the Rishonim, which we can't even relate to their greatness. They had what to call from there. And even they weren't able to fully grasp the full intention of Rashi, what was included in those words. And yet, till today, a five-year-old child is able to study it and there should be, be a takeaway to give some degree of understanding of a five-year-old child just to understand what the text is saying. It, it, it was greatness. The Meiri writes, very often if you study the Talmud, Rashi presents his commentary of the Gemara, of the Talmud, and Tosus, who's up the glasses on the page, goes and asks. So the Meiri writes that if the Rishonim, the Tos, Bali Tosus, the Tosfet were the grandchildren of Rashi, Rabbeinu Tam was a grandson. Rabbeinu Yaakov, he was, that was Rabbeinu Tam. The Rajbam, or they were his sons. His sons-in-law, he only had daughters or his grandchildren. If they would fully grasp Rashi's intention, they'd realize they never had a question. It's only because they didn't fully comprehend Rashi's intention when he presented his commentary, that's the reason why they have questions. Otherwise, there'd be no question on Rashi. That's how... It's, it's, it's a dimension of greatness we can't even relate to. Today, they speak Rashi. What was Rashi? Well, he's, he was, he was a, a vineyard keeper. He produced wine. France, this. He, he wore this kind of hat and he, because he wore the hat the way Jews, they were identified in that period of time, you know, because Jews and Gentiles, they dressed differently. You know, that, that's what we're talking about, Rashi. It's like, you know, Avramovinu, you know, he had a homeless shelter. You know, four, four directions, wherever you'd come, wherever the homeless would be flowing in, he would host them 24 hours a day. That was Avram. That was, if you study a little a bit of Torah, who Avram Avinu was, he introduced God to humanity. He only used that as a vehicle to enter into a dialogue to convince people to understand where everything comes from. We're not talking about a person, you know, because he, he had pity for the poor. That's not what it was all about. And he had a, 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 a dimension of breadth and depth of, Doing acts of benevolence, that's that what that's what drove him. That's not what drove him. What drove him was God's presence in the world. Should be known to every human being who's God's creation. But you have to study a little bit. Same thing, who's Rashi? If you study Rashi and you understand 
I once had, um, many years ago, Alan Spiegel, Dr. Alan Spiegel, when his oldest son had a upsharing. Upsharing is when people, they don't give the haircut to their son until he's three years old. So when he was three years old, he gave him his first haircut. And it was done at the Yad of Rum. So there was a person who, who came to the, uh, to the upsharing. It's called the, the first haircut. And they, um, somehow the person had some relevance to this celebration. And um, he comes over to me, he says, Rabbi, I want to tell you a dvar. Usually you say, I want to tell you a dvar Torah. Dvar Torah means a word of Torah. This person was a wealthy man. He, then he was a man about 70 years old and a real hip type guy. You know, he, even though he was 70, he dressed like he was 40 years old. And, you know, and um, he said, I want to tell you a dvar. Rabbi, I'd like to tell you a dvar. I said, fine, I'm willing to listen. So we go over to the bookcases where the Svarim, I use, call them Svarim, not books, are in the bookcases. And he puts his elbow on the shelf and um, he tells me his dvar. So I listen. So I said to him, it sounds great, but what you're actually saying is heresy. Because the way it's interpreted, the way the Talmud interprets that, that verse, it's contrary and what you're saying, it's not another interpretation. It, you, you, you're addressing the fundamental of belief and based on what you're drawing from the text, chazal, meaning the oral law says, that's not what it's, that's not what God said. He says, well, I disagree. I have a right to say what I say, they have a right to say what they say. This is what he tells me. Didn't say a word, walked away. So I went over to Al afterwards, I said to him, I said, you know, Originally, I did not, I never, nobody ever said to me, I'm going to tell you a dvar. You say a dvar Torah. But after when I heard what he had to tell me, I understood why it was a dvar, it wasn't a dvar Torah. Because to be a dvar Torah, it has to be part of the transmission. From Sinai, if it's part of the transmission and it fits within the parameters which God allows us to understand the Torah, that's dvar Torah. But if it doesn't, and it's contrary to that, you're not in the position to say, well, God, this is what you meant. You don't tell God what he meant. If God says, this is what I meant. And that's exactly what the oral law is about. So how was it guaranteed to maintain the authenticity and the accuracy and the veracity of Torah? People were chosen who had the capacity to have, appreciate, understand all the, the depth and the breadth of that information. Only they were the responsible transmitters of that. And that's what we have till today. You know, if you open any Sefer Torah, it, let it be Svartic, let it be from Eastern Europe, Western Europe, a Torah scroll, every word is identical. Identical to the other, other, other word. There's a law that the scribe who writes a Sefer Torah, he's not permitted to write it from memory. It has to be written from another text of a Sefer Torah. Another valid Sefer Torah. If it was, it's not, it's not a valid Sefer Torah. Why? Because the, and it has to be checked continuously because you never know, you, a human being is what? Is prone to make mistakes. Naturally, you know, you always have, you know, um, you have a proofreader. A person who writes something, you can read it a thousand times, you may not pick up the mistake that you've written. A third party, because he doesn't have that original reading, he comes in objectively to read, He's able to see things that you can't see. As a result of that, the proofreader, and somebody's give it over to a number of proofreaders. Because one person may have overlooked something, glossed over, and another person will see it. And only then, then you give it for publishing, for printing. Only then. The Torah, the, the law is that the scribe who writes the Sefer Torah, he should, he's not permitted to write it from memory. It has to be written from another valid, authentic Sefer Torah, which was checked, which is not a question, there may be a mistake there. And only then is his new, new production, what he writes, only then is it valid. Again, this is all to guarantee the accuracy of the text. Because you, if you make any mistake and it's copied and copied and copied, you end up with a different religion. There's a different narrative. It's not what God said at Sinai for the same reason. If you ever study the Talmud, very often you'll say, you know, the Mishnah tells us the Pirkei Ovis, we'll have it later, 
When you quote something, you're always supposed to say it in the name of the source. And if you say it in the name of the source, you bring redemption to the world. Why? Because we find, we read the Megillus Esther, Esther was the niece of Mordechai. And Mordechai had overheard a conversation between the gatekeepers, Bixen and Seresh, that they, and they spoke a language which no one understood. But Mordechai, being a member of, this, of the high court of Israel, understood 70 languages. And they were within the earshot of Mordechai. And he heard they were plotting to poison the king. Immediately he goes and shares it with his niece, who's the queen. And she gives it over to her husband. And they go and investigate it. Sure enough, it's true. And they hang these two people. And it's recorded in the chronicles of Ahasuerus, who is the Persian emperor, that Mordechai the Jew saved the life of the king. What happens? We have the story of Haman, Haman the evil one. He wants to annihilate and he has the permission to annihilate every Jewish man, woman, and child. And finally he comes where he can't tolerate Mordechai any longer. He had built a, a gallows 50 cubits high and he wants to get permission to hang Mordechai from the gallows. That night, the king couldn't sleep. He had a restless night. And he asked me that they should bring him his chronicles. And what does he find in the chronicles? Mordechai the Jew saved his life, which he forgot all about. And that's the way it was recorded. Hamad says, so, and he knew he didn't at all reward Mordechai for this exceptional good deed. So he says, so Ahmed comes wanting to get permission to kill, to hang Mordechai. And he says to Haman, the man who the king wants to honor, what would you do? How would you honor that person? And of course, Haman being suffering from megalomania, believes of course he's talking about him. He says, I would honor him by having him ride only the steed of the king to wear the royal garments of the king. And the one who should lead him through the street should be the leading appointee of the king. And he should take him through the public area, the throngs of the subjects of the king and saying, this is what the king would do to the person who he wants his honor. So he says, immediately take Mordechai the Jew and do what exactly what you said. So he originally presented all this because he thought he was talking about him. Turned out to be Mordechai. So, and ultimately this led to the hanging, the, the gallows which he had built to hang Mordechai, he was hanged with his family on that same gallows. So, but, but why? How did this all come about? Because when you say something in the name of a person, ultimately it can bring about great level of redemption. That's, that's where it's extrapolated from. You have to say something in the name of the person. So we find in the Talmud that when a rabbi very often says a, a, a halachic position, it says, Om Rav Yudha, Om Rav. Rav Yudha said the name of Rav. Om Rav Yudha, Om Shmuel. Rav Yudha said the name of Shmuel because Rav was the teacher of Rav Yudha and Shmuel was also the teacher of Yudha. So he's quoting his teacher, what he had said. But sometimes you find like this. Omar Rabbi Yudomer, Omar Rabbi Yudomer Shmuel, Omar Rabbi Yochanan, it'll list about eight different person, people, the transmission to get and identify the source of the information. You always find it throughout the Talmud. When you speak about in the Mishnah, you don't find this. The Mishnah says the way Rabbi Yudah, Judah the Prince redacted the oral law. Beishame says this, Beithil says that, Rabbi Yudah says this, Rabbi Shimon says that. But when we go to the next era, the era of the interpreters of the Mishnah, then they have to trace exactly the source and the accuracy of that transmission. Where did you get that interpretation of the Mishnah? And sometimes you have eight, ten people being quoted. This one said the name of that one. This one said the name of that one. That one said the name of And that's where it, that's how they're able. Why? What do you have all this tracing? Say, he said it, that's, and it, no. 
because they want to tell you, because who said this is the real thing? Maybe they played a game of telephone. It could have been changed 60 times over. No. Before they stated something in the Talmud, it was authenticated through, through tracing the source of that, that opinion. You find very often in the Talmud, somebody poses a question and the person says, you know, I was once walking in the market with Rabbi Yochanan when he was purchasing an animal for the wedding of his son and we had the discussion and this is what he said regarding this particular halachic issue. It's really important, the background. It was exactly in, in this market where they sold cows or where they sold leather or, or they, they, the haberdashers were or the, the fabrics, the fabric, a market. It's not relevant, no. Because all this information is to identify the accuracy of what actually, of that particular, that discussion. That's the reason why all that's discussed over there. I mean, there are other reasons also. But this is the primary reason why all that information is added, although it has no relevance to actually what's being discussed. What do you have to give us all this background information? You know, many years ago, going back probably uh, 36 years ago, so there was a person who came to Yad Avram. Today is a person a little younger than I am, which is pretty young. And he, he's a partner in a Wall Street law firm. And a uh, very significant real estate firm. And he himself was a smart guy, tough, tough personality. And how did he come? He, his father passed away and he had to say Kaddish. And we had a small group. We started off, it was 61st, right next to the Regency. We had a small base from 61st right next to the Regency. We had a minion maybe in the morning, we learned, maybe we had 15 people would come in those years. And he came and we were studying Kedushin. That was the tractate. And he was a very, you know, he was a person, didn't take anything face value. He checked it out to make sure it was exactly. And very often I quote, and I quote from memory. And he always would come back to me and say, Rabbi, you know, I checked it out. You quoted exactly the way it says, exactly. When I would say certain information, he would check it out. Rabbi, it's exactly as you said. He says, you know, it's unbelievable. He says, I'm a lawyer. And it's known fact when they have witnesses witnessing anything, 10 people, you have 10 versions of what they saw. And yet you, when you quote, it's always exact. That, that, that's the point he made. I, I said to him, his name was Jeff, Jeff Kaufman, Jeffrey Kaufman. Till now he lives out and he was a member of KJ many years ago. I'm sure Bob remembers him. We still, we're in touch. He's in Great Neck. Right, he lives in Great Neck today. He belongs to the young Israel Great Neck, Great Neck Synagogue. So he says, I said to him, I said, Jeff, I want to explain to you. When we study Torah, we're not talking about hearsay. When a person witnesses something, he's coming from his own vantage point based on all his conflicts of interest of the way he perceives reality. So everybody sees it in his own reality. When you study, it's not we're seeing it with our, many people do see it with their own reality. And therefore, it's like a person that has an idea and then he sees a text, he says, God is saying exactly what I thought of. What I've been thinking about, God concurs with me. Doesn't work that way. You start with the text and you analyze the text and the text itself, you have questions and you have to have an understanding of what God is saying. And if it doesn't, your understanding doesn't confirm what God is saying, evidently you're off track. That's not the right thing. And you have to go and delve, to find out exactly, and you have to go into the oral law. And even the oral law, you may not fully understand what we call the Talmud. You have to go into the commentators, whether it's Nachmanides, or Rashi, or whoever it may be, or Rambam. And only then, you may have a chance of coming upon the truth of what it says in the Talmud, which ultimately is the oral interpretation of what God said at Sinai. But again, just to show, and that's why the religion, as I always say, the Jewish people are known not as a cultural, as an ethnic group. The Jewish people, Jews are known as God's people, 
whether you're assimilated or not, the Jewish people are the people of the book. We're the people of the book, regardless. And they will always be identified as that. Hitler, Yemach Shmo Zichro. What he could not, besides, he, couldn't, he wanted, there shouldn't be one surviving Jew on the face of the earth. He understood what is the, what guarantees our eternity? Our connection to God. And therefore, the first thing he wanted to destroy were the rabbis and the, and the students. And all the texts that represent God's religion. That's the first thing they wanted to destroy. And then they'll destroy the rest of the Jews. Because he knew as long as the Jews have that, that's the core of their existence. And that guarantees the eternity of this people. Which we've been trying to destroy them from time immemorial. And we're not able to destroy them. You know, the first year I was in New York, I lived in Baltimore. And I would spend the whole week in New York. And every Friday, I would take the Amtrak down to Baltimore. I did this for a year. And in the winter, I would fly back on People's Express. There was an airline, it's called People's Express. And People's Express, you were able to fly for $28 from Baltimore International Airport. Then it was called, uh, Beth Cattell, it was called Friendship Airport. You were able to fly for $28 one way from Friendship Airport to into Newark. Okay, every week I would go by down by Amtrak, come back by plane in the winter. In the summer, where it wasn't possible to come back, what we call Motsoy Shabbos, after the Shabbos, I would come back early Sunday morning by Amtrak. But every week I had another story going down from Penn Station to Baltimore. Because I would sit on the, on the, on, in the, on the train, somebody would sit next to me. And the first question they'd say, and when I travel, I usually have a safer with me. And they see it's, it's not written in English. And I look like a little bit like a rabbi. And they assume it's a Hebrew text. And they say, uh, are you a rabbi? I said, yes, I'm a rabbi. He says, you know, I have a question I want to ask you. Or this has always been bothering me. Okay. So one week I was traveling down. And this person must have been about six foot four. Sits down next to me on the Amtrak. It's a good thing it wasn't a bus seat. It was the seats on the Amtrak were large seats. And he says to me, he says, Rabbi, I want to ask you a question. He says, I wanted to, I'm not an anti-Semite. I'm not an anti-Semite. But why are there anti-Semites? What somehow, why does the Jew touch these people in a way where they have this extreme reaction to their existence? Why? But I'm not an anti-Semite. This is what he tells me. I said, I'll, I'll explain it to you based on two approaches. The first approach, I'll tell you, it's, based, it's, it's on a Talmudic source. We find that the prophet speaks about the Jewish people as being the boulder of Jacob, of Israel, the boulder of Israel. Now, so that Midrash explains, and get, get it, tell them exactly how the, whether it's Midrash, Talmud, I said the Talmud explains that in the medieval times, or ancient times, they had people they were called he-men, very physically strong people. And they would have this very large boulder, and if the strong person, like Atlas, he's able to lift that boulder above his head, he'd win a purse of gold. And why was it, why did they give such a valuable prize? Because to lift that physical dimension of weight, to even to get it off the ground, you have to have extraordinary strength. And even when you pick it up, it, once you get it up above a certain height, if the person loses his balance, he gets crushed by the boulder. So the key is, the trick is to lift it above his head and then throw it off. Because if you don't, the person gets crushed by the boulder. And the Jewish people are, the, are referred to as the boulder of Israel. So the, the vision, the Talmud explains that through, since time immemorial, every civilization wanted to destroy the Jewish people. Whether it was the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and every one of the civilizations, rather than they destroying the Jews, they were destroyed through the Jews. They were crushed by the boulder. And all these civilizations went into the dustbins of history. And the Jews are still here, still thriving. 
We have our setbacks, but ultimately we come back. Therefore, the Jewish people are, are like a boulder. The bo rather than they crushing us, we crush through us, they are crushed. So I said, you know, it's something interesting. The non-Jew says, you know, we've been trying to get rid of these Jews for thousands of years. We just can't get rid of them. The audacity, the arrogance, the obstinance, the tenacity of these Jews, they couldn't do it, we will do it. You understand? So the reason why the base of anti-Semitism is, you know, you mean you didn't listen to me. I have a certain perspective. You shouldn't exist. And all my predecessors tried to destroy you and they couldn't, I will prove I will. I could succeed. That touches a raw nerve in the non-Jew. Of course, everybody else went to the dustbins of history and we're still here. This is the ultimate in arrogance. You know, that maybe confirms the protocols of Zion. There's this cabal, international cabal behind the scenes. The Jews are pulling all the strings of every society going back thousands of years. Because why are they always on the top and all of us go to the wayside and ultimately go underground and are buried? I said, that's the first thing. That's why, that's the one basis of anti-Semitism. The other basis of anti-Semitism is Jews very often succeed. Jews, because we are a people who have been persecuted and victims of annihilation, the Jew understands he can't rely on anybody but himself. And that's it. And therefore, if opportunity presents itself, they don't l l let the opportunity pass. And therefore, they apply themselves because they don't take things for granted when it comes to succeeding in their lives. Whether it's education, financial opportunity there. You know, it's not fair. Why did the Jews, why did they always, they, they were in the leadership positions. What do you think, this just comes out of, out of a vacuum? There's education, there's ingenuity, there's perseverance. There's, this doesn't come out of here. But people say, it doesn't make sense. They can't tolerate it. You know, it's the haves and the have-nots. They always believe, you know, the Jews. You know, there was a, we had a family who were party out of Rome. There was a Sassoon family. The Sassoons, one of the Sassoons, they were a member of KJ, Sali Sassoon. He was a student of mine, him and his wife going back 33 years ago. So Sali Sassoon comes from Kobe, Japan. He grew up in Kobe, he was born in Kobe. And he had cousins Two cousins were also born in Kobe, Japan. Their father, his name was David Sassoon, and he had left Aleppo in the, in the 30s. And he went to the Far East. And the Far East was what was the, like the Gold Coast in the 30s. And he went there as a single man, and he became phenomenally wealthy. He married late in life, and he was the wealthiest non-Oriental in, in the Far East at that time, okay? When he passed away, he left an estate, billion-dollar estate. You know, the Japanese are a racist people. They're racist. And for a non-oriental to have such such success and on top of being a Jew, there's only way, one way you could have made that fortune illegally. That was the confirmation. There's no way a non-oriental could succeed to that degree. And especially if he's a Jew, definitely he did illegal things through illegal means. That's how he became so wealthy. Okay? So what happens? The family, they go to court. And they spend tens of millions of dollars on legal fees. David wishes he would have been there. You know, he would have made some money on this. But in Japan, no company or corporation or law firm could embarrass the Japanese government. If you do, it's over. You'll be blacklisted. You cannot exist. So they could only bring it to a certain point 
Afterwards, they said, we're sorry, we can't, we can't maintain you as, retain you as a client. We can't go beyond this point. Even though the whole thing was anti-Semitism, racism, didn't make a difference. How did you, how does you make so much money? How does you succeed to such a degree? How, how? He did nothing illegal. Doesn't make a difference. It's the perception. How does a man like that succeed? Non-Oriental. We are the elitists, not the, not the non-Oriental. A top, a Jew. This is like, out of the, out of the statistics that we can't accept it. I don't know, but they settled. The government ultimately settled. They swept it under the carpet. They actually may give him a pittance compared to what the state was worth. I mean, they walked away with some decent, but nothing near what, 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 what the value of what they, what they had a right to. Again, what's anti-Semitism? And therefore we find, it's not only the authenticity of the Torah, that we find it tracing it to the source. Rabbi so-and-so said me, Rabbi so-and-so and said me, Rabbi so-and-so. And you can have eight names listed to establish the authenticity of that opinion. And this was evaluated. There's a discussion, not recently, we, recently we had it, where somebody said over a ruling, a name of a certain person, and he says, you can't rely on that person. Why? But if it's his brother, when he says over a ruling, you could rely on him. Why? Because his brother doesn't quote his rabbi accurately. He paraphrases it. But his brother first reviews it 40 times. And when he quotes, it's accurate. He doesn't paraphrase it. So therefore, his brother is an authentic source that you know he's quoting the rabbi correctly. But his brother, because he paraphrases and he doesn't review it as often, therefore, he's not reliable. So therefore, when he says something, somebody said something, we don't rely on it as being the exact quote or position of that person who's quoting. Again, this is the Mesorah. This is the what? The transmission of Torah in terms of its accuracy. What we have today, the Talmud Bavli, the Torah was given at Sinai almost 4,000 years ago. The authenticity, the accuracy of what we have is identical in the written and the oral form exactly as God gave it at Sinai. No different. Of course, you have to decipher it. And there are many things which we're not, we, we're not aware of any longer because we don't have that dimension of spirituality to delve into the depths of the hidden Torah, which it's in there. Ravina Ravashi, when they codified they committed it to writing the oral in, in, interpretation of the Mishnah. Everything's included in those words. But it's only limited to the few. For instance, whatever level anybody today could understand, they don't understand what the Rizal understood. The Rizal was the great Kabbalist of the 16th century. And Rabbi Shemir Choy understood. He didn't understand what Hill understood. But the Torah that he received contained within that Torah, embedded in that Torah, was everything that God had said at Sinai regarding the written and the oral interpretation of those words, which was transmitted by Moshe. I'll give you an example. We know that the most difficult statute is the red heifer. And as I mentioned, King Solomon, the wise man who ever lived, said that the understanding of Rehef, Rehefer is beyond him. He understood every statute except that. So there's a commentary in the Torah called the Sepharno writes that Moshe understood that statute. Why did he understand it? Because God gave him, when he transmitted the, that law to him, he transmitted him the understanding of this seemingly contradictory reality within the law of the Red Heifer. And Moshe gave it over to the few who are worthy to be privy for that understanding. It was not transmitted all the way to, to Shlomo Melch. King Solomon not. But it was everything. So when you study that, within the oral law, it's there. But you have to be able to cull it. You know, it's like a person has a diamond mind, a mine, and you don't have the equipment to mine those thousand deflawless carat diamonds. And you don't have the machinery to cut the diamond to appreciate its clarity and its dimension of, of beauty. 
But it's there. Everything is embedded in the Torah. And this we read Pirkei Ovos. It says, Hafrukbo, Hafrukbo, Dekulabo. You turn it and you turn it, everything's there. Every aspect of creation. You want to know what's, what's out in the galaxies. You want to know all branches of science. Everything. Hafrukbo, Hafrukbo, Dekulabo. Everything's there. You know, there's a story. The Chazonish, who passed away in the in the 50s, he was the leading Torah decisor of, of his time. And this is at very beginning of, of heart surgery, open heart surgery. And there was a certain person who was suffering from some kind of heart issue and he needed surgery. And the doctors in Israel said, if we would operate, you would die in the operating table. We suggest you go to the United States to John Hopkins, and there, the surgeons there, maybe they will succeed. But again, it's very questionable whether you'll, you'll survive the surgery. So he went to the Chazonish for a bracha. This is in the 50s, before he passed away. And the Chazonish, he explained to the Chazonish what his issue is. And he brought him the documents from the doctors, and he read it, and he says, look, I'm going to sketch the heart and I'm going to tell you exactly how the procedure should be done. If they follow this procedure, you're going to survive. If not, I advise you, how luckily you're not permitted to take that operation. Because to go on the operating table to die, you're not permitted to take your own life. He went with the sketch, showed it to the doctors, the surgeons, and they saw it, they said, you know, it makes sense. They followed that sketch, he survived. There's a cardiologist who lives in St. Louis today. His name's Alan Weiss, who today must be a man in his upper 70s. He was Rav Shach's cardiologist. Whenever he would visit Israel, Rav Shach, Zech Tzark Levrach, who passed away at the age of 107, he became his, per whenever he would visit Israel, he would go visit Rav Shach, and he would look at his record, see how he was doing. And he has a sketch of this, what the Chazonish had sketched the heart. Chazonish, did he go to medical school? Did he consult with, with, with cardiac surgeons? Where do all come from? Half of the half of the the That a person who delves in the Torah at every level and every fiber moment of his life was fully invested besides being divinely inspired and God gives him a level of clarity understanding of things everything you turn it you turn it you, you will find everything everything is contained there everything's in the Torah because what was the blueprint of creation the blueprint of creation is the Torah itself so the design of the world all aspects the galaxies Every level of existence, the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, the fish, the sea, whatever it is, everything is there because that was the blueprint for, for creation. So if the more you understand the blueprint, you understand the manifestation and the actualization of the of what? Of creation itself for that reason. The Gemara tells us in two locations that Hillel, Hazokin, Hillel the Elder, who was the prince of Israel, had 80 students. The greatest of the 80 was Rav Yonas ben Uziel. The lesser of the students was Rav Yochanan ben Zakkai. And it says, what, did, what was the difference between the two of them? One was from the greater and one was of the lesser. Mar says, whatever the greater knew, Rav Yochanan ben Zakkai knew. And it goes to it delineates what they knew. They knew everything. What's everything? They knew sichas ofos. You know, birds have a language. Birds, when they chirp, they are, they are, there's communication. They understood the, the language of the birds. They understood sichas the kolim. When the palm trees sway in the wind, there were certain things being communicated which we don't understand. They understood those communications that would be communicated through nature, through the, 
The rustling of the wind with the palm trees as they sway in the wind. They understood everything. Sichas the kolim, sichas ofos, the birds, everything. How did they understand this? They, they, they went to Berlitz. They, they, you know, Berlitz has a, has a course now. Uh, it's called uh, gibberish. That's bird chirpings, gibberish. You ever take the course gibberish? Many people speak gibberish without going to Berlitz. It's called nonsense. But when they spoke, they understood this, that meaning what the birds are communicating. They, they, they are sensitive, like, you know, when the tsunami was out in, in the Far East, the animals, they went to high ground because they sensed already the impending danger of the tsunami. The people thought they were sitting in the sun. They thought they were on top of the mountain. Within a moment, they were swept away, not knowing what happened. But the nature, they, the nature understood exactly. So if you're able to be sensible, sensitive to what the readings of nature, you would have gone to high ground also. They knew it. How did they know it? Half the boy, half of the cool the boy. If you read a little bit about the Vilna Gon, the Vilna Gon was a level, I'm, we're talking about, I'm not even talking about Torah genius, astronomy, chemistry, science. All the non Jewish professors of the leading universities would come to the Vilna Gon with questions in astronomy. They say, it doesn't make sense. A point out, and he would go and show them exactly where they went wrong. How, if they would have seen it and they, he pointed out their mistake, and once they understood everything, all the pieces fit into place. Chemistry. What's this all about? Because all that has to do with the composition of the universe, that's all rooted in the Torah itself. There's a famous story of the Beis Yosef, Rabbi Yosef Karo, he authored a work, it's called Magad Beishorim. What's Magad Beishorim? You know, the, what the Beis Yosef did, Rabbi Yosef Karo, he has a commentary on, on the tour, which is the equivalent of, the, that's the Shulchan Aruch. And afterwards, based on his commentary, he authored what we have, the Code of Laws, the Shulchan Aruch. Well, that's the basis for our law, okay? Now, the Rabbi Yosef Karo, you, you know what kind of merit is? That, that there is a Jewish people today, you couldn't have a Jewish people without a code of law. His code of law is the Shulchan Aruch. Every Jew, from the time he had authored that till today, we know how to live as Jews because of that body of work, which is called Shulchan Aruch. Covers all, every gamut, every aspect of Judaism. God sent a Malach. One of his teachers was an angel. And he has a work that he records many of the, the teachings of that angel that the angel had taught him. Okay? It's called Magid Meshorim. What he had heard from, from the Meshorim, from, from the angel. The Vilna Gon himself was so great, he was able to argue with people who were generations before him. He was at the level of, from the early commentators. And he had a communication where the an angel should be sent to him to reveal to him secrets of the Torah as the Rav Yosef Karo. Rav Yosef Karo lived in the, in the 1400s. Vilna Go lived in the late 1600s, early 1700s. Does he want a Malach? Does he want an angel? So the Vilna Go said, if it's something that I'm able to come about through my own perseverance and effort an application of myself, and I could come upon that same truth, I don't want the angel. If it's something I can't, then I'll accept the angel. So the communication was through being spiritually divine. If you apply self sufficiently, you could come upon that truth yourself. He says, if that's the case, I don't want the angel. And therefore, the angel was never sent to teach him, to study with him as a study partner for that reason, the Vilna Gon. So the Vilna Gon, when he came upon all these truths, whether it's astronomy, chemistry, medicine, whatever it was, it was all through delving and plumbing the depths of Torah itself. Because half half the kulabo. You turn it, you delve, you delve everything. As I said, if the Torah is the blueprint of existence, which is medicine and science and astronomy and botany and whatever it is, everything, then it's all there. But the question is, how do you, you have to have the key. What's the key? The key is the many keys. There are many prerequisites.
The prerequisite to wisdom is fear of God and the very levels of fear. And there's always the whole idea of what's truth. It's what you believe to be truth, yet need humility. You need exceptional levels of humility. Without humility, you, don't have, you can't open that vault. The vault has a 25 pound ton door. Without humility, God doesn't, doesn't that door, the spring doesn't open. It's, it's a sealed, it's a sealed cask. You can't open that cask. It's a vault. So the many endless, endless prerequisites that you have to meet before you even are able to penetrate the treasures and the wisdom of what lies within the sealed vault. As I said, Rashi, known as the greatest commentator, the five-year-old child could study his commentary. The greatest Torah sage could study it and still doesn't fully grasp it. And we're talking about going back to Nachmanides. Going back to Rav Shalma ben Adaris, the earlier ones. But you know, Rashi, he made wine, it outdoes Rothschild. You know, and, and some other French wine. You know? But he smoked whatever it is, players, you know, those, those type of cigarettes without filters. He smoked a water pipe. What are you talking about? You're missing the boat. I wonder who his uh, tailor was, his haberdasher. Well, well, it's nonsense. You're missing the point. Now you see Einstein and you get distracted because he wore um, a bow tie that he had to make his bow tie every day. Is that what you want to see Einstein at Princeton for? Is that what your father's paying $100,000 a year tuition? That you should look at Einstein, his haircut and, and his bow tie. Is that what you're there for? It's all nonsense. Oh, this Torah scroll. Oh, who wrote it? It looks so beautiful. I like the silver rollers. You know, the, 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 the mantle on it. I have to get that. You know, I'm going to buy it for my husband for, for his 68th birthday. And that, but that's not what the Torah scroll is all about. It's what's written on that parchment and understanding what it is and appreciate its holiness and its, how it plays in this existence and the value of this existence. But that can only be appreciated if you know Moshe Kibbal Torah B'Sinai. What was transmitted? You have an appreciation why it's so important that it should be accurate. And we're not talking about it's a dvar. Dvar, you, can, you read the New York Times, you got plenty of dvars there. We want to dvar Torah. Dvar Torah is Sinai. It's authentically tracked without question. Irrefutable. It's the divine's word. It's the God's word. It's divine. How do we know this? If it meets the criteria of ch the check, the background check on it, then we know it's divine. Then we know it's Sinai Judaism. Just to end with one, one, uh, one last story. Many years ago, somebody called me up. You know, we had a website. We never advertised. So somebody says, I heard about Yad Avram. Um, what is your affiliation? Is it reform, reconstructionist, conservative? What do you teach? I said, I teach Sinai Judaism. He says, well, I've never heard that kind of Judaism. What's Sinai Judaism? I said, you know something? When you come and you hear it, then you'll understand what Sinai Judaism. There's only one Judaism. It's called Sinai Judaism. And that's how we ended it. When the person came or not, I don't think he ever arrived. We'll end with this today. We have the Dafyomi today at uh, 11 o'clock. Everybody's welcome to join. Take care.